To be a successful entrepreneur, you should have good ideas, but the definition of a good idea varies depending on whom you ask. A great idea should have several features. Firstly, the great idea should be various and novel. Secondly, the great idea should be unique, which means no one has thought about it. Thirdly, it is essential for great ideas to be transformative and productive. All ideas are essentially a combination of other smaller ideas, but this doesn't mean they can't be unique. Merely copying doesn't make anything idiosyncratic, it's the individuality that one puts in which makes a concept stand out. Constant innovation leaves no room for stagnation and thus, adds on to the basic idea, effectively making it unique. Unique ideas are inspired by basic things, they are simply extensions of pre-existing notions. And, an idea or a concept is unique only when it transcends its predecessor and serves its purpose in a better and more precise way. From reading philosophy, I came up with three principles as the guiding principles for a just city, uh, the principles of equity, democracy, and diversity. Uh, these were derived from the works of a number of philosophers, uh, most uh, preeminently, I suppose, Don Rawls. Uh, my choice of the word equity rather than equality uh, is, in fact, based on Rawls's argument uh, that uh, a policy ought to distribute benefits uh, to people where the worst off become better off. Uh, so the worst off don't have to become equal to everybody else, but no policy should in fact make those who are most disadvantaged more disadvantaged. And it means that uh, we have to talk about the policy at the time it's being enacted. To say, well, we have to make our city more competitive because sometime in the by and by, uh, the benefits will trickle down to those people who are worst off. Uh, doesn't justify making them worst off at the time. Uh, we have a lot of examples in the world of people whose homes were destroyed uh, in the name of the greater good and said, well, eventually they will benefit. Uh, but equity means that you do not, in fact, take advantage of those people who are weakest.
In an article that you wrote that I just read, you said you wished you could take everyone back to decades ago to look at the Florida Keys. You know, 50 years ago, think about how much change has taken place in that short period of time. We have managed to consume on the order of 90% of the big fish in the ocean, the tunas, the swordfish, the sharks. They're mostly gone. Until recently, people have had the belief that there isn't much we puny human beings could do to change the nature of the ocean. But in fact, we have, not just because of what we've been taking out and the destructive means often applied to take fish and other creatures from the sea, but also what we're putting into the sea, either directly or what we put into the atmosphere that falls back into the sea. So if you were going to give a grade on the health of the oceans today, what would it be? Well, it depends on which aspect. Across the board, hmm, the oceans are in trouble. It's hard for me to assign a specific grade, maybe C minus grade. What I want to look at today is the question of how much technology, if um, a pen can indeed be called technology, perhaps I should say the instrument of writing, affects a writer's style and level of production. I also want to consider other factors that may have an effect on prose styles such as personality, educational background and so on. Now, production levels aren't so hard to measure in relation to the writing instrument used. The quill pen, for instance, would need continual refilling and resharpening, which led to a leisurely, balanced style of prose, full of simple sentences. Writing took a lot longer than now, and the great novelists of the 18th century, Fielding, Smollett, Richardson, had a relatively small output, though some of their books ran to enormous length. By the middle of the 19th century, the fountain pen had been invented, it didn't need such constant refilling, which can account for the more flowing, discursive style of, say, Dickens and Thackeray, as well as their tremendous output. Then came the typewriter, whose purpose, once you got the hang of it, was to speed up the writing process and was therefore much favoured by journalists. This, it seems to me, gave rise to a short-winded style characterised by short sentences. A short prose style, if you like, Dictating machines and tape recorders led, as one novelist complained, to writers becoming too conversational, rambling and long-winded. Henry James, although he didn't use these machines, dictated his later novels. And, well, some might agree with this accusation. Well, it looks as though we're going to have to leave word processors, computers, and, of course, the way film and its narrative techniques have affected writing style for another day.
One of the most surprising insights from Einstein is that time is not what we intuitively think it is, right? Most of us have this sense that time for you is the same as time for me. In some sense, there's this cosmic clock that's out there ticking second after second after second, dragging us all in exactly the same way into the future. Einstein found that if you and I are moving relative to each other, however, our clocks don't tick off time at the same rate. Our watches, if they were once in sync, if we're moving relative to each other, they fall out of synchronization. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that what I consider to be happening right now at a given moment, from your perspective, that might be the past or it might be the future. What you consider to be happening right now, to me, that may be the past or the future. Now, since your view of reality is every bit as valid as my view of reality, that means you can't really say the past is gone because that might be your now, your reality. You can't really say the future is yet to be. It may be the future to me. It might be your now, your reality at that given moment. So in a sense, past, present, and future are all equally real. They all exist. They're all out there. To be a British, uh, the first and important thing is the freedom of speech that we have. It doesn't matter how small you are or how big you are, you are able to shout. I think security is very important. It's a, a, a society that has a, a democracy as its basic values. Uh, there are people who come from a third world which wasn't a British colony, where they did not have uh, a democracy as such, where they grew up under a, what I call a law lord or a, a system where the king or the local uh, headman was the ruler of that particular area and he laid down the laws. And there are still parts of uh, Africa as well as Middle East where the system still exists. Uh, they, they have to follow that ritual and that's it. They cannot argue against it. While in our British society, we can argue, as the American saying go, we can fight the city hall. And uh, this is one thing which is very unique among the Western civilization, is that any voice is heard. Well, however small it is or however big it is, we have the equal authority.
the green economy could easily be the next industrial revolution. I mean, energy is, you know, we all need energy. We do an annual report um, which studies um, how much oil is left in the world and, and uh, demand for oil. And, uh, and with China, India, South America, Africa even, growing at the rate they're now growing, um, you know, we think about four or five years from now the demand for, for fuel will exceed supply. Um, that could push, you know, uh, prices through the roof. And for that reason, if, you know, if forget global warming for one minute, you know, just, just for that reason alone, we should, we should be hurrying up, you know, saving on energy and creating um, alternative sources of energy. Um, and I think those, those people who invest in this sector, hopefully, um, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get their thanks um, and, um, and get, the, get, the right, get their just returns. As physicists tried to explain the masses of particles, they found that if they just tried to inject the mass into the mathematical equations in the most straightforward way, just put a parameter for the mass of a particle right into the math, the math didn't work. It gave rise to quantum mechanically inconsistent features. So it was recognized that you needed to have a more subtle way of introducing mass into the equations that would not spoil the fundamental symmetries but yet would allow the particles to have different masses. You see, fundamentally the idea is that all particles begin life as being massless. There's a high degree of symmetry associated with that. All of the particles have the same mass, zero. How do you inject mass without spoiling that symmetry which is vital for the equations to make sense? The Higgs field does that by immersing everything in this bath, this molasses-like bath that turns out that the equations allow you to have your cake and eat it. The fundamental symmetries are deeply preserved and yet the way in which the particles move, experiencing different resistance-like drag force, allows them to have different masses.
Infinity is a perplexing idea which basically refers to something that grows without bound. No matter what number you might assign to something, infinity will be larger than that number. We make use of infinity in a number of ways in physics. We imagine that space conceivably could go on infinitely far. We imagine that in principle the universe could go on for an infinite amount of time. But in our calculations, if infinity turns up as the answer to something that we could directly measure with a piece of equipment, then we know that our calculation must be wrong. And we have used that as a diagnostic over many decades to tell us if you find infinity popping out of your equations for something you can measure, you better go back, think about those equations, modify them in some way in order to get a finite answer as that's the only kind of answer that we could ever directly measure. This simulation shows what you might see if you were orbiting a black hole. The light and position of background stars around the hole are distorted by its gravity and they seem to spin around. On the right, the constellation Orion appears to approach the event horizon, the boundary from which nothing can escape. Orion's stars look like they become separated and get spun around. Once the hole has passed by, Orion reappears on the left and looks normal again. Users can also experiment with different scenarios. This is what you might see if you were travelling towards a black hole, with rocket engines slowing your descent. Another simulation mimics freefall into a hole. In the middle, the light of the entire universe appears to be concentrated in a bright ring. Welcome to the Four Winds Historical Farm, where traditions of the past are preserved for visitors like you. Today, our master thatchers will begin giving this barn behind me a sturdy thatched roof, able to withstand heavy winds and last up to a hundred years. How do they do it? Well, in a nutshell, 
Thatching involves covering the beams or rafters, the wooden skeleton of a roof, with reeds or straw. Our thatchers here have harvested their own natural materials for the job, the bundles of water reeds you see lying over there beside the barn. Thatching is certainly uncommon in the United States today. I guess that's why so many of you have come to see this demonstration. But it wasn't always that way. In the 17th century, the colonists here thatched their roofs with reeds and straw, just as they had done in England. After a while, though, they began to replace the thatch with wooden shingles because wood was so plentiful, and eventually other roofing materials like stone, slate, and clay tiles came into use. It's a real shame that most people today don't realize how strong and long-lasting a thatched roof is. In Ireland, where thatching is still practiced, the roofs can survive winds of up to 110 miles per hour. That's because straw and reeds are so flexible. They bend but don't break in the wind like other materials can. Another advantage is that the roofs keep the house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And then, of course, there's the roof's longevity. The average is 60 years, but they can last up to 100. With all these reasons to start thatching roofs again, wouldn't it be wonderful to see this disappearing craft return to popularity? I think one of the things that's confusing for people is when they come here, there appear to be hundreds and hundreds of rules, hundreds of things you should and shouldn't do. And the truth of it is most of them are about class. And lots of them are tripwise, actually, for people who don't know them. So what I tried to do in my book was take it back to some sort of first principle and say, look, there are anthropological reasons why we have certain kinds of manners. So I'll give you a very good example. In Britain, there are sort of two ways of holding a knife very broadly. And broadly speaking... The middle classes hold it with the index finger on the top, gripped in the hand, and working class people hold it like a pen. Entirely a class distinction, and people mercilessly exploit it if they want to. The truth of it is, the one way not to hold a knife at the table is clasped in your fist, raised, as if to kill your guest. And what does that tell us about eating? Well, what it tells us about eating is two things. It's never confuse your guests with either the food or the enemy. Don't eat them and don't kill them. That's about how you should hold your knife, because actually manners are really about the reduction of violence. There's a lot in there about reducing violence. So that's just an illustration of what one tries to do. So actually, when you look at real table manners, they're about people feeling comfortable with each other, sharing food around a table. Very important human thing. And I think...
the American people are fed up with partisan politics. In a recent Gallup poll, Americans named dissatisfaction with government as the number one problem facing the country today. Americans now believe our government is more of a problem than the economy, education, and terrorism. To change the way our elected officials work for the American people, we must change how they are elected. We need to start with the first round of voting, the primaries. Thanks to gerrymandering and other factors, the primary election is often the only election that matters. In many states, less than 5% of the electorate are actually deciding who represents 100% of that district or state. That means our elected officials are actually chosen by an increasingly tiny, often incredibly partisan slice of the electorate. Today, 42% of Americans identify themselves as independents. Most states exclude independent voters from voting in the first round, the primaries. And in states that do allow them to vote in primaries, they are forced to temporarily join a party that they don't believe in. A top two nonpartisan primary eliminates party control in favor of a single nonpartisan primary open to all voters and all candidates. There is no longer a Democratic primary and a Republican primary. There is one primary open to all voters and all candidates. The top two vote getters, regardless of party, then move forward to the general election. With nonpartisan primaries, everyone gets to vote. The winners are more accountable because they have to speak to all the voters in order to get elected. Elections are more competitive. Legislators are encouraged to work across party lines and focus on issues we care about. Top two nonpartisan primaries are now used in California, Nebraska, and Washington. You've probably already voted using top two. Most municipal elections nationwide use this simple nonpartisan system. Today, activists in all 50 states are working to bring this crucial system change to their state. The movement is growing. Join us and help us create a government that truly is by and for the people. We're thinking about this, and we're trying to say, all right, well, let's file a patent on this clicker. If I were to go to the patent office and say, all right, I want a patent on a clicker, period, the patent office would just laugh. You know, the clickers have been around for a while, presentation clickers have been around for a while, and so there'd be a 0% <coughs> chance that we would actually get that. If we were to somehow convince the patent office that we should be able to get a patent on a clicker, period, it would, however, be incredibly valuable. Every single p clicker that was um, made after this point would infringe. And when it infringes, maybe we take a one or two dollars each. And that would add up to be a decent amount of money. On the other end of the spectrum, let's go to the million word version. I go to the patent office and I say, I want a patent on this exact thing. And those million words describe every single radius, every single um, uh, material, every single thing about this. And the patent office says, yeah, we've never seen that before. Go ahead and take it. Almost 100% chance of getting that patent. But the value of that patent would be close to zero.
Can we never get to absolute zero? What a wonderful question. I wish I had a wonderful answer to go with it. Here's the problem. There is actually a law of physics called the third law of thermodynamics that says you cannot get to the absolutely zero. We don't really know it's true, but we are pretty sure it is for the following reason. Every time you think of some way of cooling something down a little bit, it means you try to get energy out of that thing and make the temperature lower. Well, if you can get energy out, usually there is a way that the energy can go in as well. And that always means there is a competition between taking the energy out and putting the energy in. Now, you can try to make it so you are favoring getting energy out, but you can't completely stop the energy from going in. And that means you might be able to get colder and colder, but you won't be able to get all the way to absolute zero. Could we go back to my PowerPoint? Because I think that one of these slides will illustrate that point a little bit better. Yes, here, remember the logarithmic thermometer? There is no zero on this logarithmic thermometer, just keeps going down. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you're not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you're still not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you're still not a zero. So you start a million of a degree, now you are 10 millions of a degree, now you are 100 millions of a degree, now you are billions of a degree. You never get to zero that way. You get closer and closer, but you never get to zero. So that's why we cannot get to absolute zero.